So, almost all of the Shia groups believe in the return of some figure. As for the followers of Abdullah ibn Saba, they are called the Sabaiya. They believe that Ali himself will return and so they presume that Ali is the Mahdi. The actual Sabaiya do not exist anymore in our times. However, they were the basis upon which all of the other future Shia and Rafida groups occurred. The most famous of these groups and the group that is the most associated with the name Shia is the group known as the Imamiyya or the Ithna Ashariya, the Twelver branch of Shi'ism. And this branch is the common branch that most Muslims know. They are in Iraq and Iran and Lebanon and other places. Uh, this is the common branch and the most popular branch of Shia Islam. They are called Imamiyya because they believe that the Prophet ﷺ himself specified the Imam after him should be Ali and his descendants. And they are called Twelver because they believe in the existence of twelve Imams. These Imams, according to the Shia, have supernatural powers, so much so that they claim that the entire creation is under their control and that they are all knowledgeable and all powerful. And the Shia also direct many acts of worship to these Imams. If you look at the graves of these Imams and what the Shias do, and even without them, they, they call out Ya Ali Madad and all of these types of duas and other types of supernatural help that they seek from these beings. So they believe in these 12 Imams, the first of them being Ali radiallahu an, and then his son Al Hassan, and then the brother of Al Hassan, Hussein. And then the remaining Imams are the descendants of Hussein. They took the Imamate away from Hassan and they gave it to Hussein and his descendants. The fourth one being Ali Zainul Abidin. The fifth Imam according to them being Muhammad al-Baqir. The sixth being Ja'far al-Sadiq. The seventh being Musa al-Kazim. The eighth being Ali al-Rida. The ninth being Muhammad al-Taqi. The tenth being Ali al-Naqi. The eleventh they claim is al-Hassan al-Askari. And then they claim the twelfth and final Imam is Muhammad. Ibn al-Hassan al-Askari. Now, historically speaking, al-Hassan al-Askari did not have any children. He died a young age and he died childless. And this is something that is confirmed in all of the books of history. However, the Shias claim that he had a son whom he kept secret from the eyes of all other people. And that he went and hid this son in a cave in Samurra in the city, Samurra in Iraq. And that this son shall remain in this cave hidden from the eyes of men until his time comes and when it comes then he shall leave the cave and he shall fill the earth with justice and good as it was filled with evil before him. So this presumed son is the Mahdi of the Shias. They believe that the Mahdi is actually alive right now as we speak hiding in this cave in Iraq and they are waiting for his time to come out of this cave. They also claim that when the Mahdi will come out he shall right all of the wrong that was done to the Shias and that he shall resurrect all of the Sunni rulers from the time of the first of them all the way to the last of them. Resurrect many, he shall bring them back to life. And he shall crucify them and torture them to death because they usurped the rights of the Al al Bayt by taking over the Khilafah instead of them. And those deserving the lion's share of this torture, according to the Twelve or Ithna Ashari Shi'as, are Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Of course, it is well known that the Shi'as do not consider the Sahaba in general to be Muslim, especially the famous Sahaba. They consider them to have really left the fold of Islam and to have usurped the rights of Ali ibn Abi Talib. But they are not just content to expel them from the fold of Islam. Rather, their source books, and this I'm quoting directly from their source books, such as Usul al-Kafi of al-Kulayni and al-Masail al-Nasiriya of al-Sayyid al-Murtada and other source books, they mention that when the Mahdi leaves his cave, when he is basically set forth into this land, he shall resurrect the dead bodies of Abu Bakr and Umar, bring them back to life, and then torture them, and whip them, and crucify their bodies on trees. Look at the hatred that they have for these noble companions of the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, in some of their sources, it mentions that this shall occur more than once, meaning that the Mahdi will resurrect the bodies of these noble companions more than once, torture them to death, resurrect them, torture them, resurrect them, torture them, and so on and so forth for Allahu A'lam how many times. And they also believe that this Mahdi shall come forth with the original Qur'an, the Qur'an of Fatima they call it. Now the Shia source books, all of the Shia source books without exception, and this is something I personally have read from their books printed in their countries, from their publishers, such as Usul al-Kafi and other works, they clearly mention that the Qur'an that is existent in our times is deficient. 
and they claim that Abu Bakr and Umar and others of the companions عنهم, they took out many verses of the Quran pertaining to the high status of Ali and the fact that he deserved the Khilafah besides them. And these narrations are present, as I said, in all of their source books. And in fact, they even have books, entire books written. At-Tabarsi, for example, is one of their authors. He wrote an entire book, which I have as well. All it seeks to do is to prove that the Quran has not been preserved. And the title of the book is the proofs and the evidences that the kalam of the Rabb has not been preserved. This is that the speech of Allah has not been preserved. And so what is the Qat al Mahdi? They believe that. Fatima radiallahu anha wrote a special private copy of the Quran that is three times larger than the present Quran and which contains many verses about the wilaya of Ali and the coming of the Imams and so forth. So they believe that this Quran is with the Mahdi and when he comes he shall bring this hidden Quran with him. And this is just some of their beliefs regarding the Mahdi and of course they have many other unorthodox and heretical beliefs and this is not the time or place to really enumerate them here. We just want to summarize their point of the Mahdi. Now a number of points that we need to make here and are worthy of our consideration with regards to their understanding of the Mahdi. Firstly, they claim that he is of the descendants of al Hussein, and al Hassan, the older brother of al Hussein, who gave up his Khilafah in favor of Muawiyah, the Shias don't really like al Hassan too much, even though they don't say so. Why? Because they feel that he gave up the battle. He gave up his Khilafah to Muawiyah and he should have fought. So as a kind of retribution, they kind of took the Imamah away from al Hassan and his kids and they gave it to al Hussein and his children. So according to the Shias, the Mahdi shall come from the children of al Hussein. And of course, they glorify al Hussein much, much more than they do al Hassan. They hardly mention al Hassan at all, even though the irony is it was the Shia themselves who allowed Hussein to die the death that he did. The Shias invited Al Hussein to Iraq, to Kufa, and they promised him, and they promised him, and they promised him, don't worry, we will take care of everything. We will fight, we will do this, we will do that. And when he came, they abandoned him, and he died the cruel death that he did. And there is no doubt that his death was a cruel and unjustified death. And the fact that the Shias have gone to extremes in their love for Al Hussein and others does not mean that we do not love them. On the contrary, we love them the proper love, the real love. We love them because they were companions. We love them because they were grandchildren of the Prophet ﷺ. And we say nothing but good about them. But we also state that it is not a part of our religion to over glorify them and to make them walking gods on earth and to give them powers that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. Verily, his death was an unjust and cruel death but we do not glorify or worship these people besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, we believe that Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and all of the companions, they had nothing but love and compassion for one another. And in fact, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu gave his own daughter in marriage to Umar ibn al-Khattab. How can the Shia explain this? How can the Shia explain this when Ali radiallahu anhu gave his own daughter? And this is something even they cannot deny. He gave his own daughter to Umar. What does this show you about the love of the companions for one another? Ali radiallahu anhu gave his oath of allegiance to Abu Bakr and then to Umar and then to Uthman. Never once did he stand up and say, no, I am more deserving of the Khilafah than you. He did not invent this. And in fact, the Shia Imams, these Imams that they look up to, the fact of the matter is that when you look at their beliefs, you find that they were Sunni in their beliefs. These lies that are concocted afterwards, they did not say them. None of these Imams ever said evil of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman. None of them said so. In fact, why are the Rafida called Rafida? One of the names of the Shia is the Rafida. This is because one of the Imams, Imam Zayd, one of the descendants of the Prophet ﷺ, they came to him and they said, what is your opinion about Abu Bakr and Umar? He said, how can I say anything bad about Abu Bakr and Umar? They were the two viziers, they were the two companions of the Prophet ﷺ. And my own ancestor Ali cooperated with them. How can I say anything bad about them? So they left him. And he said, Arafatumuni, are you leaving me? Rafada means to leave and reject. And because of this, they were called Rafida. They left him when the descendant of the Prophet ﷺ himself, when their Imam refused to speak evil about Abu Bakr and Umar. So we believe that these Imams were pious people, that they never said what later groups claim them to have been said, and that all of this has been fabricated in their names.
So the first point, as we said, is that the Shia believe that the Mahdi shall be from the descendants of Al Hussein. However, for us, for the Sunnis, the stronger opinion is that the Mahdi shall be from the children of Al Hassan and not Al Hussein. And that is because, as we said earlier, Al Hassan gave up his power for the sake of the Muslim unity. He gave up his own right of the Khilafah in order to avoid civil bloodshed. And so, as a blessing to him and to his progeny, there shall come from his line a leader and a Mahdi that the entire Muslim Ummah will be unified under. Secondly, and this is really a blatant point here, notice that the supposed Mahdi of the Shia, who of course historically, he never existed in the sense, we said that Hassan al-Askari never had a son. But the name of this Mahdi is what? Muhammad ibn al-Hassan. And this is the one thing that really and truly proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is not the Mahdi, even though of course we don't believe any of this. But the most common characteristic and theme that is narrated about the Mahdi, as the Prophet ﷺ said, his name shall be my name and the name of his father shall be the name of my father. So the name of the Mahdi will be Muhammad ibn Abdullah and not Muhammad ibn al-Hassan. And how then can the Shias explain this? All of the explanations that they give are weaker than a spider's web.